Richard sends me um, an interesting question. Um, and he's been around the circles for a while. Um, so this is, there, there are a lot of people who actually have um, sort of on the periphery picked up stuff from Gamel. Um, some people working regular other jobs and that sort of thing, but just keep their hand in, in painting. And uh, I do find that a lot of ways that we say things, that, the way that we, yeah, meaning Gamel students, actually interpret things that Gamel said, they can, sort of, they can really be all over the place. And some of what uh, Richard is saying here uh, reminds me of, um, makes me think about a particular point that has, was made when, by Gamel when he was, uh, was uh, talking to us at one or two time points uh, that had to do with focus and some experiments that uh, Paxton did and then gave up on. And I'm going to describe those to you because I think that's the source of this conversation. But let me put the question. I'll just go ahead and read it to you. It says, apart from thanks for another great talk, I th appreciate that, Richard. It would be interesting to uh, hear you speak about visual focus. Visual focus, now get that in mind. I'm going to try to hang on to that word. As Mr. Gamble describes impression as seeing, that is the impression, impression instantané. I think we've referred to that more than once, the conversation of uh, Monet, which has everything to do with that. That there it is, that, that, that moment, you know, when, but nothing's changed, it's that instant. And what it is right now at this moment, uh, Monet tried to capture it uh, by limiting his painting sessions outdoors uh, at a certain time in his career to 20 minutes because the sun was moving and there was so much shift, but you had to be out there for some period of time. So, um, and then, so that's that part of that. I'm going to talk about all those things again, but, and then Sargent's, and he says Sargent's spots on an apple. Um, if you're Referring to Hale, he referred to spots on a leopard. And so we can talk about that. And the role proper um, uh, focus plays in producing a painting that's complete in detail and color. Uh, so let me just uh, say a couple things. Start with that experiment by, um, by uh, Paxton. At one point, Paxton said that your eyes, to himself, he says that if you're looking right at something, you'll notice that it doubles on both sides whatever you're not looking at. There's a double image on both sides. And you can establish that with your own eyes. So he was trying to, at one point, paint that, but supposedly. And I say supposedly, because I could never find the paintings that he did that looked like he had done that. So, <laughs> and uh, someone else of the Boston School may have gotten closer to an actual, or maybe have seen an example. It was shown an example by Gamble at one point or another. But this whole question of focus has come from the camera, from the, from the lens. And I would take camera today just because that's everybody understands. But the lens and the idea of focus is a really interesting one. But someone said to me at one point that Sargent painted, uh, fu basically it said fuzzy around the outside edges. So he focused on the middle. He literally put his eye on the middle of his subject, looking, as it were, hard at that so that everything went fuzzy all around. And it's patently not true. It's not true of any painting by any painter in history <laughs> that anybody hangs on to that. And I say not any painter because there's a thousand people who do experiments with funny things and some of which turn out to be very useful and interesting and other ones which are just uh, uh, problematical. Uh, the way I say, when I say problematical, I really mean something very specific. That, for example, when you're doing perspective, one of the reasons you back up, this may not sound like it belongs to this discussion, but it does. One of the reasons you back up so far, like to get back three times the height of the object, is to eliminate visual um, distortion. So, for example, if you're looking at the figure lying, say, lying on a table with a foot toward you, if you're right up close, the foot will be two and three times bigger than the face. And the whole subject will turn from being a figure lying on a table or a bed or whatever, it will, it will turn from that to being uh, all about perspective. It just starts becoming one of these weird things where perspective isn't what funny what perspective does. And so that becomes your subject, right? Well, you'll find the same thing with, I find the same thing with, with photography or the, the use of a lens or the idea of focus in one area and then for, blurring out on the rest. The subject becomes the, cat, the look of a lens. And it's hard to say that it doesn't. 
uh, there are lenses that are used. Uh, if it, was it Reynolds when he was young? I'm trying to remember who that was. But he has a, maybe a self-portrait where he's looking in a, in a distorted mirror. Well, yeah, it's an amusing exercise and all that sort of thing. But you wouldn't be able to say anything except that was a picture of a guy looking in a distorted mirror. <laughs> in other words, if you're supposed, you know, in, which is typical today, if you're a storytelling picture, the, that thing becomes the story, or at least it overwhelms your story. And so that's the reason I, that's the reason to, to avoid the idea of that kind of focus. So what we have, uh, what historically paintings have, is what I call a focus. And you'd, I, a person in my field, I should ask my producer, my camera guy here, <laughs> what the word they use, but we have what is the equivalent of a, of a unified field. We don't have focus. We have everything simultaneously in focus so that the viewer, rather, could wander from place to place in the picture and not feel like he's being messed with or not being left out of the story in some way. And so, um, and there's so many other ways in which the, these distortions uh, can be annoying, but from the point of view of telling a story, if you have all these elements all over the place and they have equal val you know, right to be there, uh, then you don't, and you want people to enjoy this expression of this person way over here just as much as the guy in the middle, then why would you blur their face out? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Or the story aspect of it gets really deformed. So, but the unified field also applies to Impressionism. In fact, I would argue that it implies more so to Impressionism. Uh, it's the way we see nature if you don't look hard. So anybody painting Impressionistically, I, I used to love uh, one of my fellow students with Gamble said, you can always tell an Impressionist. And he pops his eyes at us. <laughs> and of course, we were all a little stunned with his behavior. But it's like the popped eye, you know. That's, that's the afocal eye. It's the, everything's in clarity but you're not looking at a spot that makes everything else look weak. You're trying to get a simultaneity of vision. And that's the conversation that, uh, oddly, I say oddly, I mean, you can do different things depending on how you choose to like fix your eyes. But for the viewer's sake, you actually don't want to fix his eyes. You want to let him dance through your painting. You want to be, you know, be all over the place at once. Well, I wouldn't say it's because we got sort of spoiled by storytelling guys. I think it's just because Everybody knows nature. The lens is a different subject. Nature itself is a place where we sit and get to enjoy the whole set of relationships. And I'm saying that Impressionism does that. The music and all that sort of stuff I talk about. For example, if you make all the sharp edges in the middle, where's, what's the rest of the painting got to do? You know, I mean, how does it relate edgewise, right? Does everything just start with sharp edges and the simple story is that they get soggier as we got to the edge? Well, it's nowhere near as interesting as if you have sharp edges in this place and that place. And in fact, the person I was talking to about Sargent not being out of focus, at one point I was with that person, I think it was a museum or something, maybe it was just in a book, or looking at a book. And I said, way down the corner was the edge of a, you know, a sleeve or something with an arm maybe hanging out there. And the sleeve was sharper than, and whiter than anything up in the, in the area around the face with the other white shirt on, with the other part of the white shirt on. And I said, there, do you see that? <laughs> well, how was, how was he doing that down there, if that's what he was actually doing? Well, the truth is, though, that you, he's, do, he's down there with that white and that sleeve and that edge because there's a movement relating to all those things. And if you don't understand the nature of the movement of edges through a picture and the, and the, and the, and the importance of, you know, like in, you know, in the poker world, you know, and, and having, there's a value in having sets, you know. You know, you could say all, all of a kind, you know, or, or, um, or the one, two, three, four, but they come in sets. And, they, you, and, you, and there's value in them musically, right? So all I'm talking about is, for example, the set of notes that becomes the, this, the, what the soprano sings, and the set of notes that what the alto sings, and the set of notes that what the bass sings. Each one of those sets has a right to exist on its own, and it's, serve, it's, it's in a unity with all the other ones. It's so different with edges, sharpness of edges, and the distribution of them through the entire panoply of the, of the page is quite significant. So, and, you know, just as much as red will distribute through a page and, and weave is the right expression that the, the, that the uh, Impressionist uses. The colors weave in and out. They weave through the, through the entire fabric. So I think that's the larger uh, thing that I would say about that, but I think it matters. Two other things matter a little bit, and that is the instant. Gamble used to say your, you, you, your view is that as if you were driving by in a car and blink, there it was, and that's all you get. <laughs> there it is. That's the, what he was referring to as that instant to thing, you know. So 
but there is that search for, um, I mean, you can sit there and paint a painting, as I did with that portrait of the um, violinist. You can paint that painting through hours and days of change and change and more change. And you have to really become disciplined about not changing things away from the day that is the day. And I'm just saying the day is like that instant impression. It's just like you're looking for a day. If it's a blue day, if you're using North Light, you're looking for the day in which all those colors are the same. If you have one of, in one of the shots, uh, you'll see uh, the model turning orange. <laughs> You know, getting really weirdly bright, bright orange. Well, it was a cloud going by, smashing, you know, light off itself right into the frame. Well, those things, you know, those are their own instant and a wet thing. But in a portrait, you have to keep going because you have deadlines and things like that. So you work on things that don't deform the color. You work, you know, what I mean. But you, and it's all because you're looking for the unity of that first impression or that impression. The last point, though, is that spots that was referred to by Sargent. Uh, I've never read that quote. I don't remember reading that quote, but why, why wouldn't he have said that? Uh, and, but that whole discussion of painting the shepherd, of the leopard, rather, by the spots rather than by the outline. If the outline is, is, is barely visible, all that's happening with an impressionist is saying, paint the things that are easy to handle and deal with the minor things, the things that are hard to see later. Well, the, the academic guy says, where's the outline of the leopard? So when you're talking either Sargent or you're talking the Boston School, they're both saying, no, we're going to paint by the effects. We're going to paint the leading effects and we're going to organize those leading effects. So painting by the spot, and I'm going to address that in the next couple of these things, probably um, a week away from this one. Uh, but I'm, that's, that question was brought to me very specifically about how, how my approach to painting, because we showed that uh, me laying in the violinist and the gentleman said, I see that you didn't use any preliminary drawing for that. So how, what is your, how do you, whatever, he's wanting me to get into it. And that's what's going to happen next. So thank you, Richard. I hope that, uh, I may be surprising you. I don't think that was probably what you expected me to say, but I hope that's interesting to you. And please get back if, uh, if I can be any more clear or extended or, uh, or even, you know, debate. <laughs> But thank you very much. Um, don't forget to subscribe, to share, to, to um, uh, throw in comments, questions, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I forget what other things that wind up on that list. Anyway, very nice. Uh, again, uh, very good to see you. Thanks for all your kind comments. And uh, I hope they're, what I'm saying uh, proves beneficial to you.